Welcome, folks. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. When was the last time you heard from microenterprises like you? Gracias por acompañarnos en día de hoy. A series of business recovery webinars. Here we go. Welcome to Keeping Cool During Conflict. We are so proud to be here today. We're going to be learning about managing customer conflict, dealing with co-work stress, developing healthy anger management skills. Thank you so much to LAABC, County of Los Angeles, for their Safer at Work Los Angeles program providing this opportunity for us. Today we have Lilith Chokalakian. She is a founder and CEO of New Gen Global Leader. She is on a mission of developing self-aware, conscious, and evolved leaders across all generations who truly value and add value to people. Her passion is elevating, empowering, and enriching the lives of local leaders around the world. She also is VP of the Next Gen, inspiring, empowering, and elevating young generation of women entrepreneurs. She is a certified professional coach through Logos University, and she also is in partnership with Integrity Coaching and Top Leaders Incorporated. She, Lilith is a certified John C. Maxwell coach and speaker and trainer. She actually has trained me, so I'm very honored to be here with her working um, together on this podcast. And above all, she's a proud mom of two beautiful, bright, compassionate, and caring daughters who have been an inspiration and drive to create a better world for all today and after future generations. Will, we're so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much for being here. So we're going to just open up first and just talk a little bit about customer conflicts. What is customer conflicts and how should we deal with it? Awesome. Thank you so much, Erica. It's good to be on this podcast and thank you for that introduction. It's really awesome to be working with you again. Like you said, we worked together in the past and it's just a joy and and an honor to be able to add value to all the business owners, to everyone who will be listening to this podcast. Today, like you said, our first segment is talking about customer conflict. And I would like to start off the segment with my favorite quote by one of my favorite mentors, John C. Mann. Maxwell, as Erica mentioned, he is one of my mentors. Um, People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. The reason I find this quote very fitting for this segment is the fact that every single human being is created uniquely, shaped differently through our environment and experiences, and has a freedom to choose according to their beliefs, feelings, their needs, their customs, their cultures, and so on. But as different as we all are, Every single human being wants to know that they're valued, respected, understood, and that they matter. Bottom line, they want to know that we as leaders care for them. So if you think about it, conflict is very common in our work environment and life in general, because we are all so uniquely, beautifully different. And at the same time, we're similar. And there are so many, there's no magical pill. Let me say this one thing from the start. There's no magical pill that I can give you to help you with the conflict resolution. But the best way is to prevent conflict to start with. So will will we be successful at preventing 100% of the conflict all of the time? No, not really. But if you don't take the steps to prevent it, we would have not done our due diligence, especially as leaders. So what I want to break it down into three sections today, and you'll hear most of the segments, all of the segments actually that we're going to talk about is I always break it down to before, during, and after. The reason being is that very often we tend to operate in a reactive mode, especially in 2020 with a pandemic and all the challenges we have this year. We are constantly finding ourselves that the challenges come comes up that we are we don't know how to handle. We we have to be in a reactive mode. But in general, in business, we can be in proactive mode if you we take the steps to prepare. So my goal is to help you see that we can be proactive in many things, especially reducing the conflict, the customer conflict. So before, even before conflict has a chance to rise up. 
let's say possibly customer is dissatisfied with the bill she or he received, customer is dissatisfied with the service or the product. There are decisions you can make and steps you can take to eliminate possible misunderstandings. For example, communicate clearly your price structure and the value they're getting. Make sure your staff is trained and equipped to serve the customer with the utmost respect and authority. And they have, the staff has the authority to make decisions if you're not present to do it yourself. Think about your experiences you and your staff had with a dissatisfied customer in the past. Do you see any recurring concerns, complaints? If you have a red flag, review what it is causing the recurrence of these complaints and fix it right away. You will be basically going to be in a continuous cycle of test, fail or succeed, learn, improve, or re-enter. So if you're, you, you know you just went through a conflict, you realize when you look at it, you're testing something that you're gonna change in the way you approach the customer. You're testing it. Um, is it successful or is it failure? You learn from it, then you improve, you implement into your process, and then you re-enter again. So this is a continuous cycle that, and it doesn't only apply in a business, it applies in any relationships, in fact. Test, succeed or fail, learn, improve, and re-enter. So remember that cycle. If you're new to the business um, and don't have much experience yet, start being intentional and mindful about your interactions with customers. See where the risk can be. Don't let the experience go to waste. For example, you can reflect about the experience and learn to apply what worked. That is a lesson as well. What really worked? Was the customer satisfied? What did you do that was satisfactory? So it's a learning process constantly. As you make a reflection and evaluation part of your business experience, you will see the areas for improvement all the time. So also in the area of self-leadership, as a leader, you would want to have a clear picture about yourself. How much do you value your customers and are willing to serve? What is your general attitude about your customers? What is your attitude about conflict? How you approach it determines the direction conflict will take. How can I give more use value than cash value to the customer? In other words, it's the leader's responsibility to always exceed expectations, go above and beyond. I'm not talking about you constantly give things for free, but you do provide value, more use value than cash value. There, these are the decisions you need to make beforehand and operate by. This is who you're becoming, basically. So now let's move to, to, to into a during section. The customer is not happy. You need to address the conflict. You have a customer that's sitting there is dissatisfied. There is a process I want to take you through, which will help you reduce the tension and get the win-win resolution. Remember, it's so important to come up with a win-win resolution because that way you show the customer that you really care. And we'll talk a little more about that. And at the end, I'll talk a little more about sometimes we cannot come to the win-win resolution, right? But at least our goal needs to be that. So first of all, first and foremost, you're the leader. You have the customer that you need to deal with. And I have to say this, check your emotions at the door. This is a self-awareness and self-leadership step. Ask yourself, am I able to leave my emotions aside and listen objectively to come up with a mutually beneficial resolution? If the answer to this question is no, it might lead to escalation of the situation. So you need to figure out what will you do if you cannot leave your emotions aside? Do you need to assign somebody else to handle this? Or you need to take the time to put your emotions aside and sit down with clear judgment, clear mind to figure out to focus on the customer. Secondly, express your apology and commitment to resolving the conflict with a win-win approach in mind. Please be sincere. I cannot emphasize this enough. Please be sincere in your apology. This is the first and most important step you can take to show the customer that you care how often we hear apologies from a customer service representatives that are either clearly just reading the script or they apologize at least 100 times during the duration of the conversation, which totally loses its value and sounds so insincere. So sincerity in your apology is the door opener. It's basically it's gonna open the door and your customer is gonna be open-minded to hear, to speak and to express and share with you. Open communication is the key in any dispute because it shows transparency, care and eliminates misunderstanding based on assumptions. So now let's go to the third step. It is listening. 
Uh, you probably will say, well, I listen all the times. So I have two ears. But this is the most one of the most important steps because this is really it's showing your willingness to take the time and listen to the customer to what they have to say. To listen to the customer and that listening will express how much you care. Um, you might have heard one of the Zig Ziglar's uh, famous quotes, don't chase money, chase helping people and money will chase you. So this is the step, the listening step. <clears throat> is when you're actually indirectly telling the customer, I'm here to help you. So number one, what about listening? Why am I talking about, why am I making such a big deal about listening? Active listening is so important. Listening with your eyes, hearing what the customer is saying. It's not just the words, it's a body language, it's the gesture. Listen to connect with the customer. That's such an important step because if we're not connecting with the customer, we cannot hear and understand them. Look at the other person and give your undivided attention. We're living in, especially the small business owners, we're so busy with so many things, distractions that are happening in our lives. I literally suggest to my clients, take the phone and flip it down upside down so you do not get disrupted by the phone rings or the text messages that you're constantly getting from your other customers, right? Make sure you, you, you create that environment that you're, you're giving your undivided attention to the customer. Don't interrupt is another way of listening. That's an element of listening. Don't interrupt because if we interrupt, we're telling the customer, I really don't care about what you have to say, or I don't respect what you're saying, or I already know the answer, right? We want to just listen through and make sure we understand and suspend the judgment. Don't jump to conclusions. Again, we might assume we know what the problem is. We, know, we might assume we know what the customer is feeling, but suspend your judgment. Don't jump to a conclusion. Listen all the way through and focus on understanding them. You see how many elements this listening step has? Um, because listening is not just what we are just listening to all the time. There's a lot of noise what we can listen to, but this listening step is so important, has so many elements. And the last and most important element is understanding your customer. You wanna listen to hear what customer has to say. You wanna listen with your head and heart connection, meaning you're listening to both the content of what the customer is saying and the feelings. Listen with your intent to understand and don't, like I said already before, don't assume you already know the issue. Listen with the mess for the message and the message behind the message. Some customers might have had prior experiences, similar experiences, and they're so afraid that and heard from that experience that they're feeling that they might be being taken advantage again in this experience, in this transaction, right? So you want to listen to the areas where they're afraid and hurt as well. And you want to listen with empathy and acceptance. So those are the ways ways to understand the customer when you're listening fully attentively listening to hear you're telling the customer I really care to hear what you have to say that's our third step listening the fourth step is ask questions for clarity and reiterate your understanding of the problem to make sure you're not making the assumptions fifth step is review options show the customer what are the options ask the customer what is the way that we can resolve this situation what is the best way that will be uh, um, that will be beneficial for you. And finally, end with a win-win resolution. This is the, the, generally this is a step, is the easiest close if you've done the first five steps uh, properly. But I say generally because no matter how much you intend to come to a mutually beneficial resolution, you might be dealing with an unreasonable customer who refuses to come to an agreement. If it is possible and makes physical sense for your business, I would always say the preferred solution is to make sure customer is happy. Even if you have to provide full refund, add another product to the package, add another service, doesn't mean you need to go against your intent integrity or any other extremes that will harm your business. There must be boundaries with what you will be willing to give or do to make sure the customer is satisfied. And this is a part of decision you need to make in the before step, before the conflict even occurs. What is it that you're willing to do to make sure the customers are satisfied? What is that you're willing to give, right? So those are the steps during the conflict that happen. Now let's look at the after. What happens after you came into you came to this win-win resolution? You have this customer is finally satisfied. Customer leaves your presence if it was in your office, or you hang up if you were speaking on the phone. What do you do after? After the conflict, you really want to sit down and reflect on it, reflect and think. 
what are the procedures that I need to change? What is the training that I need to provide for my staff? What was the reason for the conflict? And what can we change in a business to make sure that it's prevented? Would it require you to re revise your customer agreements? Would it require you to add more details to the product descriptions to make sure there's no misunderstandings? Whatever the steps you need to take, just take it and uh, add to your procedures, make sure that you can prevent the conflict. But one more step you still need to do with a customer is follow up with the customer. If you follow up with the customer to make sure the customer is satisfied, to make sure the customer is still satisfied and they would like to come back or they don't, make sure they receive their refund, make sure they receive their additional product, whatever you did to make sure this is a win-win resolution, you need to follow up and let them know that you do care, you still care for this customer, right? So bottom line, as a business owner, there are a few decisions that you can make beforehand and always continue to reflect, revise, to make sure you're not leaving anything anything to misunderstanding and conflict. Every single person on this planet, regardless of their gender, regardless of their color, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their religion, locality, beliefs and habits, you name it all. Every single person wants to be valued, respected and feel that they matter. As a leader, it is your responsibility to make them feel that way, that they matter and have a positive influence on everyone you interact with. And I would like to close this segment with another favorite quote of mine. It, this one is by Maya Angelou. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So any conflict resolution, remember that. How you make your customer feel, show them that you care and you will have a returning customer and more happier customer. Thank you. Oh, Lily, that's such great information. Thank you so much for what you just shared. I really enjoyed how you put it into like the cycle and you had listed out all the different um, areas to focus on during that time of the conflict. I know sometimes it can be so conflicting that's the word conflicting to where it happens all of a sudden it's like how do I handle this situation what should I do and I also love how you brought up bringing it into a learning process how I'm going to learn from this experience what can I do better in the next time um, how can I be more prepared what type of training do I have to do and most importantly the customer like making sure that the customer or whoever um, the conflict is with is that they know that you know, there's that sincerity, there's that empathy, that understanding, knowing full well that, you know, somebody, no matter what the outcome is, as you said, the goal is to make it a win-win outcome. So however that can be achieved. And um, it's just such great information. I know, especially nowadays, there's so much going on that everybody is challenged up to some higher level. At least I know I feel that in my personal experience of being challenged and so how can I deal with the day-to-day -day and make sure that I still show that empathy compassion understanding and I want the people that I'm you know around to know that I feel that or that um you know that they're important they're important for that let's move on now to stress another great topic to talk about oh yeah Oh, yes. Thank you so much, Erica. I love your wrap up. This was awesome. Um, and, and yeah, like you said, this is such an important uh, topic as well for today. And it actually relates a lot to a customer conflict as well, because uh, what, what creates the conflict a lot of times is the stress that we're living in. And that's why I feel like this is such a great segue into our next topic, which is stress. I'm so excited to talk about it today because my goal is to provide you with the tools and ideas to reduce the stress. Um, as everyone will agree, year 2020 presented us with more challenges than any other year before. Obviously, and rightfully so, a lot of business owners are stressed out about the future of their businesses and all the changes they have to make this year. They had to make this year to, to pivot, to adjust, to adapt to what's going on. Not to mention a lot of business owners that had already closed their doors and now they're trying to figure out what's next. What do I do now? While at the same time, every single person, like you said, Erica, we're struggling with our challenges that we're facing in our at home, with our in our communities, with our personal lives. So stress is like, such a such a valid such a great topic to talk about and the stress levels are very high for everyone and like I said that a lot of times can lead to a conflict a customer conflict 
I'm sure many of you um, know and have heard about damaging impact of stress on our health. I'm not going to go through the list of all the illnesses caused by stress right now. You can literally Google and find out. And we all know there's so many illnesses that are literally caused by stress. But I will just summarize it by saying stress will rob you of your health and your quality of life. I just want to say that to re realize the importance of knowing how to handle stress. So my goal is to help you understand stress and how to handle it. This is something that everyone can learn. And the reason I'm so passionate about it, it is that it will carry you through many other future stressful challenges, stressful times, changes we'll have in our lives. Learning to how to handle stress is the way to go. It's not to eliminate the challenges. So challenges come in many shapes and sizes. This year pandemic is not the first and is not going to be the last challenge you will ever face. So knowing how to handle anything that comes your way is the key. I'm sure you have heard the saying, and I know, Erica, you said we worked together before this, teach them how to fish, don't give them the fish. That's my favorite phrase because in every training, in every coaching, my goal is always to give the tools, to teach them how to use the tools, how to apply the tools in, the, in your lives instead of just giving you a solution, giving you the fish um, and so on. So this is my approach generally in my all coaching practices, both private and group, which I'm bringing to our conversation today. First and for, for, foremost important step is understand what causes stress. In other words, what are the stressors? We all know they're stressors. We all have different stressors. Some of us have similar stressors or not. But generally, we think that stressors are negative. For example, personal loss, family loss, business loss. But anything that puts high demands on you can be a stressor. It doesn't always have to be negative. I will give you an example of stressors, and I will ask you actually to write down, to jot down the ones that describe what the stressors that causing you stress. I want you to kind of be more interactive in this segment. I want you to start thinking, what is it that gives me the most stress? What is it that keeps me awake the most, right? So first one is being under a lot of pressure. This year, we a lot of people are under a lot of pressure, right? Facing big changes. Does it have to be with COVID pandemic reason or changes through caused by different reasons? Worrying about something, not having much or any control over the outcome of the situation or having overwhelming amount of responsibilities or having no work, no responsibilities whatsoever, right? Not having enough work, activities or change in your life times of uncertainty, and many, many, many other triggers that can be stressors that can be there that create the stress for you. So like I said, what gives you the most sleepless nights? Write it down for yourself. Keep it in front of you so you can see um, as I'm talking about the steps that you can take, see how it's applicable. So next, I want to talk about two important words, which are we all are too familiar with. Those are worry and disappointment. Both worry and disappointment are huge contributors to stress, regardless of what your stressor is. Let's look at worry first. Excessive worry leads to stress. What is worry? If you look up in the dictionary, which I actually did, it defines a stress, uh, it defines worry as give way to anxiety or unease. Allow one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. You notice how it implies that you're the one that is allowing yourself to dwell on difficulties. I'm not minimizing all the difficulties you are facing right now. All I'm saying is where we allow our mind to dwell or intensely um, on intensely is what creates the worry and leads the stress. Where focus goes, energy flows, right? So if we're dwelling on negative all the time, our entire energy flows to the negative. Clearly, pandemic has put all of us in a new normal mode that is extremely uncomfortable and at times scary for those who have lost their jobs and struggling to find their ways. As justifiable as the worry is, in times such as this, worry is our enemy who distracts us from our mission in life. Worry is actually wasting your energy, motivation, focus, because it paralyzes your mind and your creativity. That's the most important part that we have as humans is creativity to figure out how can we move forward right now. So what is the solution? You're going to laugh at my solution. I'm going to say, do not worry. I'm not going to start singing, don't worry, be happy. I'm just <laughs> going to say, don't worry, do not worry. I know you're probably laughing. I know. Easier said than done, right? But bear with me and please think of an experience you have had in the past when you worried to death about them, 
And now in the retrospect, you look at it and you realize how perfectly it all worked out. I'm not saying you'll have to deal with a fine, you will not have to deal with financial issues, with work issues, with time issues, any other issues life brings to you. But worrying about them is not going to make anything better. Because like I said, it's 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 robbing you of your creativity. It's robbing you of other opportunities, seeing other opportunities. In fact, it makes things worse, right? Because our cl- our mind is clouded with fear and confusion. So how can you reduce worry? I will share with you, with you a secret. Worrying about things we have no control over is pure laziness and excuse. Mm-hmm. Worrying about things we have no control over is pure waste of time and energy. I know this might sound harsh, but I have to open up, unpack this for you. There are things that we have direct control over and there are things that we have no control over. So no matter how much, how you look at it, worrying about either ends is useless. It's wasting our energy and it's useless. Things that we have direct control over is our responsibility. Generally your health, your time, your health, when I say your health, obviously, unless you have specific medical condition, but I'm speaking in general, your health is your responsibility, your time, how you spend your time in a day is your responsibility. How and when you spend your money is your responsibility. Do you spend your money on what you want or on what you need, right? How you invest your money is your responsibility. So these are just a simple example. So what is what is our responsibility? If we're, we're looking at and worrying about finances, am I doing what is my responsibility as far as finances are concerned? Am I saving? Am I spending on things I need, not on the things I want? Those are the little steps that make a huge difference. But when you worry, um, when you worry, I challenge you to stop and ask yourself, do I have a direct control over the situation? Am I worrying about something that I have a remedy for and I can do something about it? Then why am I not doing it? That's why I said it's laziness an excuse. But when I'm worried about something that I have no control over, then why even worry? My solution, I have no control over it. My solution is to pray about it and give it to God. That's my solution. Have faith. When you worry about things that are out of your control, you have no more space left about taking care of what is in your control. That's my solution, right? Don't occupy the space with the worry and don't confuse, cloud your mind with fear and confusion. That's the reason I say do not worry. The second dangerous word I wanted to talk about is disappointment. Again, um, excessive disappointment usually leads to stress. So what is disappointment? It is the gap between the reality and expectations. What is the reality that you have, we're living in today and what are your expectations? If we're expecting to live an easy, stressless life and realities that life was not meant to be easy, then we will be living in this huge gap called the disappointment. So let's set the expectation that the stresses of life are real and will always be there. Once you set that expectation, it will eliminate the disappointment because it closes that gap. And when the challenges come, your mind is clear. Your mind is able to see the opportunities instead of focus on the problems. So this will help you shift your mind, basically. And every challenge always brings an opportunity. That's another expectation you want to set. Every challenge has a hidden opportunity within it. If you're focusing on the problem, only on the problem, you're not seeing the opportunity. So now you have this framework about what causes the stress. And I hope you wrote down your your own stressors and you know what are your stressors. You recognize the damaging impact of these two words, worry and disappointment. You're probably now asking me, so what do I do now? And then my answer is attitude shift. Attitude is everything, is not everything, but it is what makes a difference in our life. I'm sure you have heard some people saying, I see the cup half full. Other people saying, I see the cup half empty. And I want to challenge you to review your attitude and shift it to help you fill your cup. So let's talk about attitude shift to constantly fill you. I want to help you to constantly fill that cup. What usually determines if you have a good day, week, a month, a year, for example, this 2020, what will determine how was your 2020? Well, let me tell you something. The reality is it's not your circumstances. It's not the people around you. It's not the finances. The only thing that determines how good your day, your week, your month, your year, your experience has been is your own attitude. The only thing that determines how much stress you will internalize is your own attitude. So let's look at the attitude definition. It's a settled way of thinking 
or feeling about someone or something which is typically reflected in your behavior. Just think about it. Your attitude is even reflected in your behavior. So you see how your attitude can impact your business as well as your relationship. Um, as my mentor, John Maxwell says, the world you see is colored by your attitude, the colors of the world that you see. And I love this quote. Let me share with you the attitude traits of successful people who rise above challenges and stress. And, and I want you to take notes of this five different attitude shift, not an attitude shift, but you will use this to shift your attitude. So number one is positive attitude. You want to go from negative to positive attitude. You want to shift. If your attitude has generally been negative, switch it to positive. See and say things in a better perspective, better way, better light. It does not mean I'm asking you to bury your head in the sand like an ostrich by ignoring all the things that are going around us. All I'm saying is to be selective with what you allow in your mind. Stop listening to a negative news. Stop wasting time on social media, reading all the negative posts. Whatever we fill our mind with, impacts our thinking, impacts our attitude, impacts our feelings, our behavior, and the stress level. And eventually it impacts our success level. Number two, teachable attitude. You want to adapt a teachable attitude. Be willing to listen, to read, to learn from people you admire and look up to. This day and age, two phrases that really drive me crazy are I'm bored and I don't know how. With technology that we have today, all the answers are literally at your fingertips and so many opportunities to learn new skills and trades. So have that teachable attitude, uh, adapt that teachable attitude. Number three is solution-oriented attitude. When, I, I said it already before, when your attitude says that there's always a solution, that sets your mind in expectant mode to start seeing the solutions. But your mind won't be able to bring those solutions to light if you focus on the problems. You're in the darkness. Your mind is in the darkness, right? So number four is whatever it takes attitude. Persistence is when you get knocked down, you don't stay down. You get up and you try again. Whatever it takes, I will continue on my mission. Even if I have a detour, I'm going to get back and continue on my mission. That's the attitude you want to adapt. And number five is attitude of gratitude. Attitude of gratitude is the magnet for your success. When you're grateful for small things, more blessings always come your way. So this attitude shift that I just, I wanted to see, help you see is you want to adapt this five different attitudes, positive attitude, teachable attitude, solution-oriented attitude, whatever it takes, attitude, attitude of gratitude will make a difference in your life and in your stress level. But to be able to achieve these attitudes and maintain it, who you spend your time with and what you give your focus to will determine how sustainable your new attitudes will be. Unfortunately, we are surrounded by a lot of negative people. We are bombarded by negative media and we are overwhelmed by negative circumstances starting from home and all around the world. So to be able to maintain the attitude traits I mentioned earlier, you will really need to have the support system. Surround yourself with people who are always willing to do the work on themselves. Self-leadership, again, it always starts with a self-leadership to shift their attitude and easily adapt to challenge. And then, yeah, that support system will help you hold each other accountable. So in conclusion, I wanna reiterate that stress is a normal part of life. It cannot be avoided because life was not meant to be easy, but your expectations and attitude will help you rise above the stress and current challenges to focus on a solution, to see the hidden opportunities to grow through experiences and to preserve despite the hard, uh, persevere despite the hardships and to be grateful with everything you do, everything you have, being grateful. Have people around you, whether you hire a coach, you have a friend, a family support system, you hold them accountable and they hold you accountable on this journey. In fact, not only you will be living a less stressful life, but you will actually have the energy, motivation and drive to live your dream life. I also know that once you make the attitude shift, not only you will be living less stressful life, but every single person around you will see the joy in you and they will want to live the same life. So thank you, Erica. Oh, thanks, Lilith. That was so great. So yeah, I took some notes for myself to think tonight before I 
and or when I end my day, kind of reflect on my stress and find out exactly, you know, what it is that keeps me up at night. And um, and then I really like the thing that where you brought up about um, I knew worrying was a waste of time. Like I always knew that, but I never ever um, connected it to laziness or as an excuse. It, to me, I felt like if I worried enough and worried enough about something, it would make a difference. And it really doesn't. And I like that. Um, also, the five positive attitude traits for me to change the positive part of the attitude trait. Definitely take your negative behavior and make it a positive attitude of gratitude is a wonderful way of looking at things and solution oriented what's the solution what am I going to do how am I going to you know kind of instead of sitting in it and wallowing in it like I normally would be doing let me get into the solution and also I'm teachable there's so much like you said so many resources to help me be teachable and whatever it takes, I'm willing to do it. Again, it goes back to where it's that personal leadership, that personal self-discovery, able to, you know, do things for my myself and figure out, okay, how can I take this, you know, into my day-to-day and what can I do? This has been just so great. I've so enjoyed this. Again, I want to thank um, LADC for having us be able to have this opportunity with the County of Los Angeles and the Safer at Work program through Los Angeles. We're just really glad to be a part of this. This is just very beneficial, especially at this time. So we're going to get into now a little bit about anger management, another one of my favorite topics. But I do want to go back to one thing that I forgot to say prior to with the customer conflict was the um, checking my emotions at the door, remembering to do that. Like, let me put my emotions to the side and see what I can, you know, set it aside and kind of deal with what I have to do with the day to day kind of runs hand in hand then too with the same thing with the um, dealing with my stress, not letting anybody really see the stress I'm under you know, and kind of just keeping that at the door too. So we'll now move into um, our developing our healthy anger man- management anger management skills. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erica, for a great wrap up. And you're right, uh, checking our emotions at the door actually is it's a great, um, a great transition into our anger management because a lot of times when we're not able to, we're not able to control our emotions. That a lot of time leads into anger, right? So anger management again is such a great uh, con- segment to continue with. Stress leads to anger in a lot of ways. So this segment I will talk, we'll be talking about anger management, and I want to start it off by saying that I don't believe in anger management. Now you're going to say, what is she talking about? It is like time management. Can anyone manage time? We all have 24 hours a day, no more, no less. So no matter how we try to manage it, it is still that same 24 hours. However, we can only manage how we spend that that spend that 24 hours, our 24 hours. I have this 24 hours. How am I spending it? That is the element of self-discipline. I'm not managing time. I'm managing myself. Right. So similarly, when we think about anger, it is it is impossible to manage anger. We can only understand what causes the anger. In other words, the triggers and manage our response to it. To me, it is more about exercising self-awareness, self-control and again, attitude. Right. And we talked about attitude in the earlier segment. So just as a disclaimer, though, there are times that anger is so deep rooted in a traumatic event from the past that really need a professional help to address them. So I would highly recommend to hire a therapist or some professional help that can help you heal the wounds that are leading to that anger. I'm not, I don't want to minimize the, the causes, the triggers of some anger that are really deep rooted. What I'm talking about is in general, where, where do we have that self-awareness and self-control? Don't overlook and, underst- and underestimate the anger. It is in a way your subconscious mind telling you that you have pain that needs attention. I look at anger as a fever when you have a cold, right? Fever is a sign that your body is fighting some kind of an illness. Fever is telling you that you need to pay attention to your body. Fever by itself is not the root of the problem. Similarly, anger is an indication of a deep-rooted problem that needs your attention. Don't blow it off by saying, I can't help and I'm an angry person. Really address it and, and recognize your triggers 
to understand what it is. Is it really? And again, like I said, I don't want to minimize. There's some um, some uh, experiences in life, physical, emotional, mental, that are really deep rooted that need therapist help they need more professional help what i'm talking today about in general our anger that is caused by stresses that we're living in so let's talk about anger first let's talk about understanding what anger that is and then how we can ha handle unaddressed anger when it has already surfaced first of all again with the definitions which i love to do anger is a strong feeling of annoyance displeasure or hostility it is an emotional state that is reflected in many ways anger can actually be healthy did i say that yeah i did anger can actually be healthy historically speaking anger is an adaptive response to threats anger has a tendency to motivate us and propel us as long as we know how to effectively address it and channel it productively. And I'll give you an example later on of how I channel sometimes my anger very productively and my house is spotless clean because when I'm angry, I really, uh, I, I, I channel that actually sometimes in a, a physical work and start cleaning the house. So you can channel the anger productively, something that causes it when you address it and you realize that you need to deal with it you can product, channel it productively. My approach, as, as you've heard already from my prior two segments, is always before, during, and after. If we don't make a decision in advance, we're basically in reactive mode. If we don't know how to handle it during, we will be frustrated even more, and it is it will cause us even more anger. And finally, if we don't reflect and learn, we will repeat the same pattern. So number one always is to understand what is my triggers, right? So let's let's start this process during before, during, and after. Like I said, anger is a fruit of a deeper issue. It's not the root of the problem, it's the fruit of the problem. So we need to look at what causes the anger and manage that instead of anger itself. In other words, let's look at the triggers. Number one, worry. In the earlier segment, we spoke about worry and how worry means allowing one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. Worry can lead to stress. We know that excessive worry leads to stress, which eventually leads to anger. When we worry, the flight or fight response is triggered and body's sympathetic nervous system releases stress hormones such as cortisol. And this is the only medical term I will ever talk about. <laughs> I'm not talking too much medical terminology here, but it's important to understand that there's a physiology behind the worry, right? There's a physiology. It's not just our attitude. It's not just our mind. It's not just our thinking. And if it's a worry about something that you have no control over, then the flight response turns into a fight response, hence comes out as an anger. Do you understand? So we're not going into a flight mode. We're going into a fight mode, and that turns into the anger. Number two trigger is a sadness. Similarly, with sadness can be a trigger for anger because it is not addressed it, and it leads to frustration and anxiety. Sadness can be can uh, can be caused by so many things: loss in life, disappointment in life. Sadness is all around us all the time. It can be the trigger. Number three is anxiety. Anxiety is the feeling of nervousness and unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. Again, when we feel out of control and stressed over every uh, over everything, we often assume the outcomes of events that are generally not favorable. We become more agitated and we get angry. So pay attention to what I just said. said. We usually assume the outcome of events that are generally not favorable. Why do we do that? This is a human nature. When we don't know the outcome, when we don't know the answer, we start assuming. And unfortunately, we assume the worst. How many of you, you usually assume the best? Very rare, right? If the kids don't call when they, when they were supposed to call me they're, or they're not answering the call, the first thing mom assumes is like, what happened? Why is she not answering? What's going on, right? Unfortunate, that's a human nature. So we, we want to make sure we pay attention that when we realize that anxiety is caused sometimes by our wrong assumptions, and that will lead to anger. Number four is comparison. This is a huge one in our society. Identity crises are cause of our ineffective education system and highly competitive society we live in. 
So very often comparison becomes a dr- trigger for anger because people don't feel that they fit in anywhere and they don't know who they are, especially in the young generation. They have this huge identity crisis and it, it kind of develops into the anger mode a lot of times. And once that's not addressed, we become more insecure adults. And the fifth one is insecurity. When people are insecure about their own worth and value, they tend to perceive as if everyone else is putting or putting them down or minimizing their value or disrespecting them. Hence, that leads to anger as well. And uh, sixth one is guilt. Guilt about something you regret from your past. Behavior, your words, or even thoughts develop anger toward yourself, number one, and very often to anger towards others because we look for the blame in others as opposed to taking the responsibility. So guilt can also be a trigger for anger. And lastly, attitude of unforgiveness. When you hold grudges and are not able to forgive those that have wronged you, you will eventually take it out on others through anger. Don't hold grudge. Give grace to others and give grace to yourself. Like I said, guilt, the six, uh, the sixth trigger that I talked about, that's also because you're not giving yourself grace. Remember, we all are humans and make really bad mistakes and choices sometimes. But if you're willing to forgive others, why would they, if you're not willing to forgive others, why would they forgive you, right? So remembering to forgive attitude of unforgiveness leads to hang, anger. How many of you know someone who keeps replaying the scenario from 30 years ago about how his or her partner, for example, business partner, stole money from the business, which resulted in a bankruptcy, or even uh, after that, she ne- he or she never picked up the business, was still struggling, and all the failures of their life are blamed on that one experience 30 years ago. I'm sure you have multiple examples of people you know that are replaying the same scenario over and over again. And while they do, and while they share, you can feel them living that experience. You can feel their entire emotions and feelings and their whole body is relieving that experience. That comes from the attitude of unforgiveness and that's what holds people down. And that's what actually leads to anger. So. This is just a list of few triggers. Like I said, I'm only going to give you a few. If you wrote it down, anything that, that is your trigger or you can add to yours. Number one was worry. Number two, sadness. Number three, anxiety. Number four, comparison. Number five, insecurity. Number six, guilt. And number seven, attitude of unforgiveness. Um, the reason I wanted to start with them is recognizing what triggers you will be the first step. As I always say, without self-awareness, you won't know what needs to heal and change. And also you need to have that desire to change. I have to say, this is not going to be an easy journey because it will require you to be brutally honest with yourself and be able to face the strongholds and the pain that's in the root of the problem. But I promise that if you, you, you're you willing to take this journey, it will be really a worthwhile journey. That's why I said earlier, make sure you have a support system. If it's extremely traumatic, physically, mentally, or emotionally, make sure you have that support system that can hold you accountable, that can actually guide you through that pain. And depending on severity of triggers, um, your support system, like I said earlier, could be your friends and family who you trust, who will hold you accountable, and who will not judge you, but know what questions to ask you to help you um, overcome those triggers. You must have heard many say, when you're a leader and you own a business, make sure you have a team that is with you, your accountants, that make sure that your financials are in, in, in order, your attorneys, make sure that you're, uh, you are uh, complying with all the laws and are protecting your business, your marketing team, your specific industry and dry advisor. But very rare is spoken about having a professional support that will hold you and help you grow uh, personally and help you unblock anything that's holding you back. So it is critical because you cannot give what you do not have. You need to keep filling your cup up and sometimes emptying it of all old stale water before you can add a new fresh water. So make sure you have a professional help on the team. 
Once you recognize your triggers, we're going to move into now during. Once you recognize your triggers, you can actually reflect and think about how you can respond when you realize be, you're being triggered. You really need to think about what you're feeling and what you're going through in your mind and kind of make those decisions. And then during the process, during when you're already in that mode that you're angry, there are a few steps that you really want to take that will help you eliminate the anger explosion that will help you to calm you down. And if you're ready to take your under under your anger under control, let's look at this seven steps that I want to present to you. Number one, take a time out. Sometimes we think it's only for the kids. No, it's for adults as well. We need to take our time out, a few moments of quiet time to center yourself, to do, do like Erica said earlier, to recognize what am I feeling about it, right? Get out and walk physical activity, like I wrote with my example, when I get angry, when I realize that I'm being triggered, physical activity, for me, it's cleaning my house or going out for a walk, whatever that physical activity will be, is important for you to recognize and know. Practice relaxation techniques that work for you. That's the third one. Mine is a slow walk in the sun and praying to God for wisdom and guidance on how to handle situation. What is your relaxation technique? Do you know? Again, this is some things that you actually have, should have thought about in advance. You kind of have an idea about yourself, right? The fourth one is use humor to release tension. Humor always diffuses the tension. I'm not going to go into a medical explanation of how humor actually really helps, helps us a lot. However, the very, um, the very fact is that humor does diffuse the tension is important to remember. But be very careful not to turn that humor into the sarcasm because it will actually elevate the anger um, experience. Number five is identify possible solutions. Again, we're looking at the solutions, right? Solution are orienting. Um, instead of focusing on what you made, what made you angry, focus on the solution now. Remember, we spoke earlier about this, and this is very important to always remember. I always ask, is this in your direct control? Or is it not in your control at all? Once you work on coming up with the solutions, you will regain the control over your thoughts and tension will be reduced. And you will know what can you do now? What is the next step? A lot of times we humans feel stress and anger and anxiety because we feel that we're losing control. And this step will help you regain that control. Number six, check where your heart is. Remember what comes out of your mouth is what's in your heart. Yeah, you've heard this, if you squeeze an orange, only orange juice will come out, right? Um, I'm sure you have heard another saying that circumstances don't make a man, they reveal a man to himself. So that's a sixth six step. Just look at to check your heart, where your heart is. And number seven is communicate. Finally, after you have done a few steps that will help you calm down, communicate with the other party. Communication is the key. Communicate with respect, timely, and with clarity. You can express your disappointment, anger in a respectful and mutually beneficial way. Explain your perspective and willing to understand the other sides as well. So as we discussed all these seven steps, I challenge you to think about them beforehand and decide how you handle in the moment of anger. How would you handle? How would you take those steps? Do you know what helps you relax the tension? If you don't figure it out, do you value people on your team or people in general? So those are the questions you want to ask yourself. If, if, if the answers are no, you want to find the answers. Remember, I said it is a tough journey because you will have to be brutally honest with yourself. And you will most likely to have to unlearn certain things, thoughts and beliefs, and learn new ones. So if you desire to have a change and you desire to have a better life, and you desire to have an anger-free life, you will have to embark on this journey and be willing to change. Thank you. Oh, such great information, good tips to hear. Thank you so much, Lilith, that is so great. I like how we can address our triggers, like what, what is causing the anger and then um, taking the time out to address it, to sit with it. Like I try and do that with myself, sometimes I, I'm unable to do that. And then afterwards I look back and think, okay, let me, you know, see where it all comes from. What's, what's happening, what's going on. And then having the seven, you know, tips of taking time out, taking a walk, do physical activity, relaxation methods, how to identify the possible solutions, 
And I love using humor. Humor and laughter really, really has, um, you know, benefits the problem, the solution, the answer. And also, too, I've noticed like in the workplace, too, sometimes um, if we've had like issues of stress or any type of thing, sometimes we'll just start laughing. And then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like, oh, my gosh, you know, it's so great to have that humor to bring some relaxation to the moment. And it changes the energy in the office, doesn't it? Totally changes the energy. Totally. Yes. Um, this was so great. So many tools, so many resources that we did. Daily checklists, attitude of gratitude, check my emotions at the door, a win-win resolution, listening, keeping an open mind, hearing what somebody else is saying. So many great, great tips to take take with me today and others to, you know, to be able to be able to bring this into their workplace and just want to thank you so much for being here thank you again to LADC for having us Um, and also please visit their website at LADC.org to get any type of resources that they have available lots of information on there take the time out from your day and to um, write your checklist and see where your stresses are and what you can do about it and the solutions you can use so thank you Awesome, Erica. And I do want to say thank you as well. Thank you for um, for facilitating this discussion. And thank you for LAEDC for the opportunity to add value to our community, to, to the business owners, to whoever is going to be listening to this podcast. Hopefully this helps and relieve the stress, relieve the anger, and everyone is challenged. So LAEDC is doing such a great job adding value, um, like I said, um, going above and beyond, right? exceeding expectations. So awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody and be safe and have it.